Good evening and welcome to Harvard's John F. Kennedy Forum. Uh, my name is Bob Putnam. I'm the director of the Center for International Affairs at Harvard. And I'm honored this evening to introduce the Honorable Stephen Oxman, Assistant Secretary of State for European and Canadian Affairs, to speak on the theme, Building Peace and Prosperity in Central and Eastern Europe, a U.S. Perspective. It's hard to imagine a timelier topic than this. Um, after three painful years of difficult decisions about how to manage problems in the ex-Yugoslavia, we're now barely three days away from an ultimatum that the NATO alliance has delivered uh, on the, uh, in the area around uh, Sarajevo, as we're all well aware. Um, in dealing with that urgent problem, as well as the other complex issues that have emerged in Europe, East and West, in the aftermath of the Cold War, uh, President Clinton is uh, counting on the advice and support of Stephen Osman, and we're honored to have him with us today. Before serving as Assistant Secretary of State, Mr. Osman was a managing director of Wasserman Prella and Company and deputy chairman of Wasserman Prella International, an international investment banking firm. Uh, he graduated from Princeton University, uh, magna cum laude, and holds a PhD in, or rather a DPhil, I should say, in uh, diplomatic history from Oxford University, where he studied as a Rhodes Scholar. He's also uh, graduated from the Yale Law School, where he holds a JD and served as an editor of the Yale Law Journal. Uh, he's uh, published uh, several uh, books and articles and uh, served during the Carter administration as executive assistant to the then Deputy Secretary of State, Warren Christopher, and was appointed in January of 1993 as Assistant Secretary of State. Uh, Mr. Oxman, we're delighted to have you with us, and we're looking forward to what you have to say to us. Thank you very much, Bob. I appreciate your kind introduction. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you this evening. Um, it's a special pleasure to be at the Kennedy School as one who had the privilege for my sins of spending a few years at a certain institution in New Haven. I'm pleased to finally have the opportunity to see how the other half lives. Um, I'd like to speak to you tonight about United States policy towards Central and Eastern Europe, and then to take your questions and exchange views. Let me begin, uh, though, with a caveat. Uh, some of you may recall Adlai Stevenson's famous words delivered at the outset of a policy speech. He said uh, to his audience, your job tonight is to listen, and my job is to speak, and let's hope that we both finish our jobs at about the same time. <laughs> so I'll do my best for, on my end. <clears throat> Given the uncertain evolution of reform in the former Soviet Union and the ongoing tragedy in Bosnia, uh, some would treat with benign neglect those countries moving with less apparent trouble toward democracy and market economies. Such an out of sight, out of mind approach toward Central and Eastern Europe, however, could not be more wrong, in my view. The road to stable democracy and functioning free market economies in these countries is long, it is bumpy, it is winding, and it will remain so for some considerable period. We all know of Russia's Zirinovsky and the fundament fundamental anti-reform, anti-democratic, anti-Western reaction he represents. What is less well known is that in many countries of Central and Eastern Europe, little Zhirinovskis and other reactionary forces are emerging that seek to appeal to societies tired from the tension of transformation. The point is that reform's ultimate success cannot be taken for granted. While we've knocked down most of the walls of the past, much remains to be done to build a free and prosperous future in this part of the world. I propose to sketch for you tonight the problems and promise of Central and Eastern Europe, and then I'll explain why we as Americans should care about this part of the world, and finally I'll tell you what it is we 
in the Clinton administration are doing to secure the success of reform there. And as I will explain, the bottom line uh, is that this administration, as the President demonstrated in Prague so forcefully last month, is committed to an activist policy in the region, a policy designed to help consolidate democracy in two ways. First, by promoting prosperity, and second, by promoting security. Our own interests demand nothing less. Now, before commenting on the problems and the promise of this region, let me first define what I mean by Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and what I will call tonight Eastern Europe, for ease of reference, or simply the region. Um, the better accurate phrase is Central and Eastern Europe, but I will call it Eastern Europe. I'm talking about the 15 countries that are west of the border of the former Soviet Union. They break down into the four so-called northern tier countries, or the Visegrad Four, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia. The three Baltic countries above, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. The so-called southern tier of Bulgaria, Romania, Albania. And then the five former, the five uh, countries that comprise the former Yugoslavia. That's what I'm here to talk about. And it's a fascinating region. Uh, these 15 countries uh, range from the largest, Poland, which is about half the size of the state of Texas, to the smallest, Slovenia, which is about the size of the state of New Jersey, where I come from. It's an area of about 450,000 square miles, which is almost twice the size of the state of Texas. Has 135 million people, about 2.5% of the world's population. It accounts for about 2% of the world's GNP, GWP, as some call it, about $530 billion. That's one-twelfth of the GNP of the United States of America, even though they have half as many people. Per capita in the region, GNP is roughly on the order of about 4,000 per capita versus about 24,000 in the United States. Uh, that's, the, that's the region I want to comment on, and uh, I'm not going to, in my prepared remarks, get into all of the very important issues about Bosnia and the tragedy we're facing there and the important policy developments, because I'm sure that will be topic number one or likely to be topic number one in the question and answer period. And I'm happy to get into that. <clears throat> With respect to the problems and the promise of this region, it's been said that a pessimist is nothing more than a well-informed optimist. And recently, many of my East European friends and colleagues have complained that they've become too well-informed. Certainly, the euphoria of 1989, when the people of Central and Eastern Europe made an inspirational commitment to democracy and free markets, has faded. The after-effects of 45 years in the Soviet straitjacket make that commitment difficult to maintain. The core problems are economic. Transition to market economy involves, at a first stage, the decontrol of prices, freely tradable currencies, and the reduction or even elimination of state support for industry, all of which ensure efficient resource allocation and competitive, competitiveness. The short-term economic results in Central and Eastern Europe have been unsettling, surging inflation, plummeting production, and mounting unemployment. We are confident that these hardships will fade as economic reform begins to bear fruit. And indeed, some countries in the region are coming out of the trough. For example, GNP increased last year in Poland, Albania, and the Czech Republic. But most of the economies in the region remain far from robust. The result is pain, confusion, and frustration that are godsends to demagogues of the left and of the right. At the same time, as they face these economic challenges, the East Europeans are striving to create democratic political institutions, almost from scratch. Acquiring the habits of democracy cannot happen overnight. We should find cheer in the fact that free and fair elections have been held throughout the region after nearly half a century of sham elections. And independent media and political parties are sprouting on what seems to be a daily basis. 
Yet we cannot escape the irony that it is through these institutions of democracy that the discontent brought about by economic hardship finds its expression. Public opinion polls show a marked resurgence in support for the old apparatchiks who have relabeled themselves socialists or social democrats. One price we pay for freedom is that we cannot select its beneficiaries. <clears throat> East Europeans also have legitimate concerns about their own security. The potential for conflict exists not only in the former Yugoslavia, but in many parts of the region, as old nationalistic tensions frozen for almost five decades are unleashed. In addition, worries about the ultimate outcome of reform in the former Soviet Union make people sleepless in Slovakia and elsewhere. Yet for all the gloom and doom, the region's potential is real, and, <clears throat> and it is tremendous. 135 million well-educated, determined people now have the freedom to speak their minds, to create, to build, to prosper. This dynamic human resource, which even in the darkest days of communism gave the world a Milan Kundera, an Andrej Vida, a Václav Havel, has been unshackled. Of course, we cannot rest on the laurels of promise. As my State Department colleague Charles Gotti puts it, we must close the gap between big words and small deeds. But we mustn't lose sight of the promise as we confront the difficult realities of political and economic transition. I am convinced that ultimately the relevant questions for peace and prosperity in this region are not whether, but when. Not if, but how. Let me now address why, why it is we should care about this region, we the United States. <clears throat> the last presidential election showed that Americans of all political persuasions understood that a strong and effective foreign policy begins with a sound economic foundation. But it is also true that such a foreign policy is an, is an essential ingredient to economic well-being at home. Put another way, strong and effective foreign policy and domestic prosperity are mutually reinforcing concepts, not a zero-sum game. Nowhere is that lesson more clear than in Eastern Europe. For one thing, the events of the 20th century have demonstrated that brush fires in Europe, and especially in Eastern Europe, may well flare up into all-consuming confl conflagrations that burn us badly, both in material and human terms. Nothing will better assure stability and prevent dangerous conflicts than vibrant democracy and free market economies. As Secretary of State Christopher has put it, and I quote, states that operate on democratic principles tend to be the world's most peaceful and stable. A world of democracies would be a safer world. Such a world would dedicate more to human development and less to human destruction. It would promote what all people have in common rather than what tears them apart." Close quote. Perhaps nowhere else can the administration's goal of enlarging the community of free market democracies be so readily advanced as in Central and Eastern Europe. Nor can we afford to be indifferent to those 135 million consumers in the region, not to mention another 285 million in the former Soviet Union. Our well-being calls for reaching out to, trading, to new trading partners. Actively promoting the recovery and growth of East European economies will go a long way toward assuring our own prosperity by opening huge new markets for Western goods and services. So much for self-interest. We must also help the East Europeans because it is right. The United States challenged them to cast away the shackles of communism. Now that they have done so, we have an obligation to work with them to ensure that they receive the rewards of freedom. Let me address what the United States is doing to help ensure the success of reform, to help ensure it. We can't do it on our own. It's going to be largely a function of internal factors, but we can help. That President Clinton traveled to Prague on his first official trip to Europe was no accident. The President sought to underscore the importance we attach to Eastern Europe and to describe what we are doing to cons help consolidate democracy there. Two distinct yet connected concepts constitute the foundation of our policy, 
promoting prosperity, and enhancing security in order to consolidate democracy. I'd like to elaborate on those two pillars. First, promoting prosperity. If the economies of Central and Eastern Europe are to prosper, they ultimately must be integrated into the global economy. For this to happen, we must overcome two principal hurdles. First, as my friends and colleagues from the region argue eloquently and correctly, we need to continue improving access for them to our markets. After all, we can hardly beckon these nations to join the fraternity of democracies with one hand while keeping them out of some of our markets with the other. Second, for increased market access to be meaningful, the countries of Eastern Europe must manufacture goods that are both needed and competitive. Yes, they already produce some such goods, for example, steel and agricultural products. But only the full transition to vibrant market economies can ensure these countries a thriving future as traders. This full transition will require hundreds of billions of dollars, in my view. I'm hardly revealing a state secret when I tell you that the bulk of these monies must come from the private sector, given the budgetary constraints on official creditors and donors in the West. This is as it should be. After all, the goal is to create self-sufficient free market economies, not dependencies. Ultimately, trade and investment must replace aid. <clears throat> In making this point, I would not want to minimize the importance of our official aid. Since 1989, the United States has given Eastern Europe about $8 billion in financial and technical support and debt relief. Our assistance has been used for a staggering array of projects. To cite just a few, we've helped the Czech Republic draft a modern bankruptcy code, trained private commercial bankers in Slovakia, supplied propaganda-free books in Albania, and provided equipment and training throughout the region to help establish modern and independent media. This is money well spent. Down the road, it will pay large dividends in security and prosperity for both the United States and Eastern Europe. The return on our Marshall Plan aid of almost 50 years ago to Western Europe makes the point. Adjusted for inflation, we provided Europe with about $95 billion over four years in Marshall funds. Today, Europeans buy from us nearly $120 billion in goods and services every year. And these figures do not take into account billions of dollars in defense spending that surely would have been necessary had we been forced to contend with instability or even communism in Western Europe. But as important as government transfer payments can be, it is private capital that must feed economic growth in the East. Since the collapse of communism, private investment there has been, in Eastern Europe, has been modest, about $11 billion. This is far short of its potential and a fraction of what is needed. I saw this directly in my work as an investment banker before I took this position. The shortage of capital in this part of the world is really staggering. And the fact is there are private sources of capital in the Western world which are very interested in the possibility of de deploying in Eastern Europe. But private capital flows are a trickle, not a flood, in no small part because of barriers to investment in this region. So as we seek to provide greater market access in the West, we must also take steps to improve the investment climate in the East. I see several basic barriers to increased investment there, including investor uncertainty about the ultimate success of political and economic reform, lack of a clear, complete, and consistent legal, tax, and regulatory infrastructure, which is crucial to winning the confidence of investors, insufficient physical infrastructure, especially state-of-the-art communications capability, and inadequate domestic capital markets. When you think about a Western investor deploying capital, having identified a certain portion of their capital budget for investment outside the United States, as, as most of the large U.S. companies have done, uh, that capital, 
that can be deployed in a variety of places. It could be deployed in Eastern Europe. Uh, it could be just as easily deployed in Mexico or Argentina or India. And I know from having worked with uh, corporations that they look very, very carefully at these capital investment decisions. They don't have a particular patriotic loyalty to putting that capital in one country or another. They're looking at these very criteria that I mentioned. What is the security of my investment going to be? What is the legal and tax and regulatory infrastructure in this country? Um, what is the quality of the workforce? Um, Eastern Europe, in my view, is very well positioned to attract capital, but it's in very severe competition for capital with the Mexicos and the Argentinas and the Indias of this world. And I think the region can compete more effectively, um, more effectively for capital. Some of the countries in the region have done quite well. If you look at the numbers on the Czech Republic in terms of capital investment, foreign direct investment there. But if you look at some of the other countries, it's, it's very weak. And uh, there's no inherent reason why this should be so, in, in my view. Now, we've, had, we've uh, in the United States government, tried to help address these problems. Beyond the direct assistance and debt relief I alluded to earlier, we have led economic missions, negotiated bilateral investment treaties, and established privately managed investment funds. We also are strongly supporting early membership for the East European countries in the OECD, which provides advice and tough peer pressure reviews to ensure open investment and trade policies in all member countries. But for all these past and ongoing efforts, President Clinton is convinced that the time is right for a series of integrated new initiatives to improve the investment climate in Eastern Europe. Many of the countries in the region have now undertaken some of the reforms necessary to build credibility with investors and creditors, but others are and others are progressing in the right direction, but there's, there's a way to go. And that is why the President announced last month in Prague a series of initiatives. As a first step, we plan to hold a major conference this year on trade and investment in Central and Eastern Europe. This conference will have one central objective, to engage the Eastern Europeans in constructive efforts to reduce these obstacles to private investment that I've alluded to. We hope in the United States government to serve as a catalyst in this regard for an ongoing dialogue between the Eastern European officials and the private sector leaders in the West who control these capital investment decisions I've referred to. And I want to emphasize the word ongoing. The conference, a conference if it's just a one-shot deal is not really meaningful. But if it gives way to a series of follow-up measures that can transform good ideas into reality, and we have in mind a number of follow-up measures, then it can make a difference. In tandem with the Trade and Investment Conference, we will increase our efforts to help Eastern European governments deal with the social and human dimension of change by providing assistance targeted to social safety net programs. We will, we will promote regional infrastructure improvements, particularly through projects in which our own companies can enjoy commercial opportunities. We will expand the Overseas Private Investment Corporation's activities in the region through additional privately managed investment funds and a fourfold increase from 50 million to 200 million in per project lending limits for OPIC. Now let me comment on the other pillar, that is enhancing security. These efforts to help the countries of Eastern Europe that I've mentioned economically are likely to be in vain if they are not coupled with steps to increase the region's security. Instability is, after all, a strong disincentive to investment, and it can derail economic reform. That is why I am convinced that the recent NATO summit was a signal moment for the emerging democracies in the East. There were two historic developments at that summit. First, NATO made it clear that it welcomes and expects expansion of the alliance as part of an evolutionary process. That is a very major new development in NATO. In addition, NATO beckoned its former Warsaw Pact adversaries and others to immediately join a partnership for peace so as to begin the practical process of enhancing security in Europe. And I'll comment on that practical process in just a moment. 
Those of you familiar with the opinion pages of the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, uh, and not to mention the Harvard Crimson, no doubt, no doubt took note of the criticism directed by some at our summit initiatives. Pundits argued that we should have offered immediate NATO membership to the countries of Eastern Europe instead of a supposed halfway measure like the Partnership for Peace. It is true that NATO membership now sounds like an easy solution to the security problems facing Eastern Europe. But as H.L. Mencken, Mencken once said, for every complex problem, there is a solution which is neat, plausible, and wrong. Let me tell you why the Partnership for Peace is the right answer. It will give partner nations a chance to engage in very real, very practical military and defense cooperation with NATO and with each other, and to develop the capacity to assume the responsibilities of full NATO membership. It will also help create a truly integrated Europe without now drawing new lines which exclude some countries. And it will do this without diluting NATO's capabilities or impairing its current mission. Some partnership critics invoke the emotionally powerful specter of Munich in 1938. They argue from this German analogy that it is appeasement not to admit the countries of Eastern Europe into NATO and to build a new Iron Curtain to, to protect the rest of Europe from Russia. I submit to you that this is the wrong German analogy. Rather, I would ask you to look at how we treated Germany after each of the two world wars in this century and at the results of each policy. At Versailles, the victorious allies left Germany isolated and burdened by punitive political and economic measures. This approach created conditions that facilitated the rise of Hitler. In it were planted some of the most fertile seeds of the century's greatest dislocations. After World War II, on the other hand, we worked to support Germany economically and politically and to integrate it into Western Europe. As a result, we have enjoyed half a century of unprecedented peace and stability in Western Europe. Now, no analogy is perfect, and we must not seek to write the future by reading exclusively from the past. But still, this history suggests that our policy toward Eastern Europe and Russia today should find inspir inspiration from what we did in 1945 rather than in 1918. And that is precisely the approach we have followed with the Partnership for Peace. We want to see a fully integrated Europe of democratic free market states committed to each other's security in the same way that the NATO countries are today. That goal can best be achieved if we reach out and invite Russia to be part of this process, rather than leaving it outside the door of the new Europe. Of course, should the reform experience should reform experience a reversal of fortune in Russia, we can reevaluate NATO's needs and those of the Eastern Europeans. At the same time, active participation by them in the partnership will go a long way toward enhancing their military preparedness and allow them to consult with NATO in the event of a threat. In the months ahead, we will seek to make the Partnership for Peace operational, both politically and militarily. As a Polish leader said to me last year, with the Partnership for Peace, the angel is in the details. I think by that he meant that the way we design the Partnership for Peace without any differentiation up front, but permitting the members to choose the level of intensity of their own involvement, and in that way to distinguish themselves by their own efforts. So there is a self-differentiation feature to the Partnership for Peace. And that's, uh, that's what I think he meant by saying that the angel is in the details. Through the details, we will be able to craft the partnership into an effective instrument to advance our goal of security throughout an integrated Europe. Virtually all of the nations of the former Warsaw Pact have announced their intention to join the Partnership for Peace. As prospective partners formally sign up, and many have already done so, they will submit proposals outlining the military assets they will make available to the partnership. They will describe the steps they plan to take to ensure civilian control of the military in their countries and to make their defense, their defense budgets open to public scrutiny. 
The partners will send representatives to NATO headquarters who will work with each other and with NATO to plan joint exercises and operations. We expect the partnership to hold joint peacekeeping field exercises later this year in which NATO troops will actually work side by side with their former adversaries. And I suggest to you that that will be a very powerful symbol and signal to the world. This is what we mean when we say that the Partnership for Peace will help the emerging democracies develop the habits of cooperation and the routines of consultation that are the lifeblood of the NATO alliance itself. Although participation in the partnership is not a guarantee of NATO membership, it is the best, best path to NATO. And it will help ensure that when NATO does expand, its new members are both fully committed to the political principles that underlie NATO and prepared to meet the obligations of NATO membership. The Partnership for Peace is the right answer to a complex problem. It allows us to work toward the best possible outcome for Europe while keeping us prepared, just in case, for the worst. The initiatives I've described that bolster democracy through trade and security cooperation are being augmented in a critically important way. We are working hard to promote grassroots dem democratic reform. In Prague, the President announced the Democracy Network, a $30 million fund to support the work of non-governmental organizations in Eastern Europe in such areas as social policy and the rule of law. And those of you familiar with the region will know that many of these non-governmental groups there are doing uh, heroic work and have a tremendous amount to contribute. And we can help them through, our, through the fund I've just mentioned. The funding is, uh, may sound modest, but this kind of effort can have a multiplier effect disproportionate to its size. It's remarkable how often you hear that from people in the region, this multiplier effect that can be stimulated. In this way, we can hope to deepen the roots of civil society in Eastern Europe. I would also like to note that we intend to play a watchdog role to ensure that freedom of expression is not merely pro proclaimed, but is practiced in all the fledgling democracies. As Justice Cardozo once said, and I, I think this is such a wonderful statement, freedom of expression is the matrix, the indispensable condition of nearly every other freedom. Progress has been made in Eastern Europe in securing freedom for the print media, despite persistent restrictions on the dis distribution and availability of newsprint. An even greater obstacle to building open societies is, the pr is progress in broadcast freedom. After all, television, in the words of uh, David Webster, who's a, a superb uh, uh, expert on this issue of press freedom in that region, television is democracy's biggest megaphone. And it must not become the captive of any one party. Let me try to pull these themes together and conclude so we can get to your questions. The fall of the Berlin Wall was a unique moment of historical catharsis that we in the West shared with the East Europeans. For 45 years, we worked together to free them from the yoke of communism. While we were determined in our efforts, I suspect that many did not believe we would ever actually succeed, at least not in our lifetimes. That the end came so suddenly made the moment all the more intense. As a result, the post-euphoria stress that we are now experiencing, which is exacerbated by a severe economic recession in Western Europe, is deep and at times even demoralizing. But we must not lose sight of all that has been accomplished in such a very short time. After all, just five years ago, the countries of Eastern Europe were still captive. At the same time, we must admit that consolidating democracies takes time. Democracy cannot simply be declared. It must be created and nurtured. The Clinton administration believes that the United States has a fundamental stake in seeing Eastern Europe flourish. By doing what we can to improve the region's economy and security and to support grassroots reform efforts, we are helping lay a strong foundation for democracy. 
This will be a lengthy, difficult process re requiring the kinds of new partnerships between East and West that we saw emerge in Prague last month. But it will also be an exhilarating, mutually beneficial adventure. And in that sense, I know that our engagement with Eastern Europe has only just begun. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. I, um, uh, we're looking forward to having an opportunity to discuss some of these issues, uh, and I will uh, let you uh, uh, take uh, questions uh, in our conventional way here at the, uh, at the forum. I want to uh, say, first of all, uh, what I should have said uh, in my introductory remarks, that this, um, that this presentation is brought to, brought to all of us uh, uh, through the uh, efforts of the Euroforum, which is a group of uh, Harvard undergraduates concerned especially with uh, international affairs. Uh, and I should, in, in particular, recognize uh, Leah Pizar and uh, Henrietta Shields, the past and uh, present president of Euroforum, and thank them for their efforts in, in uh, bringing, uh, uh, bringing Mr. Uh, Mr. Oxman to us. May I, sir, begin, take advantage of my uh, position at the microphone, to begin by asking you um, a question uh, not focused exclusively on the issues of uh, reconstruction in Eastern and Central Europe that you talked about, but rather, as you invited us, to ask a question about um, the tormented uh, area of Bosnia. Um, I think all of us, no matter what our views on that issue, feel that the last 12 months of Atlantic diplomacy have been rocky and ragged and uh, costly in terms of uh, solidarity within the alliance. And I uh, want to ask you, what lessons you think that the administration is drawing from those 12 months? What now will we do differently or might we do differently? What, uh, what um, role do we see of uh, leadership and how will we exercise that differently because of the lessons of the last, of the last 12 months? Well, thank you for that question, I must say. This is one of those problems when you're working on it day in and day out in the trenches. It's hard to step back and, and draw lessons uh, too easily. Uh, I think, uh, though, there are a couple things I could say about that. Um, we feel very strongly that uh, if we're going to make a, a threat of the use of military force, um, as the President said in Brussels on January 10, everyone in NATO who puts those words on the piece of paper, on the NATO declaration, has to be prepared to carry that forward. And we have been able to build that consensus uh, within NATO with U.S. leadership. And as you know, on February 9, NATO did issue an extremely uh, serious uh, warning with an ultimatum aimed at helping relieve the strangulation and siege of, of Sarajevo. And we can talk about that, that further. But I think uh, that is a key, a key lesson. Another lesson is that these situations are so complicated and driven by such deep hatred that if you can get them early, rather than let them fester and burn and flare out of control, you probably have a better shot at achieving a result with much less loss of human life and much less strain on the relations among European nations and between European nations and the United States. Uh, I don't say that in a critical sense. I think when this problem arose, it was a problem of quite a new character. We weren't used to it. It was in the prior administration, obviously. Um, NATO had never had to address such a problem before outside of its area. NATO was not designed for this type of situation. But I do think that in terms of lessons we can draw, um, early action, preventive diplomacy is really uh, an area where uh, more can be done. Those would be two things, Bob, that I would comment on. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, Secretary Oxman. My name is David Shore. I'm a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School. And uh, as it happens, my question is exactly on uh, preventive diplomacy and, and uh, asking to tease out a little bit uh, more what that means. Secretary Christopher has stressed the need for an anticipatory or pre preventive diplomacy, and it, it came to mind for me when you were speaking about the region's demagogues. 
because it, when I think of preventive diplomacy, I think of undercutting the polarization that demagogues try to affect uh, with uh, a uh, chauvinist politic. But uh, I am interested in, in knowing, uh, because the problem is relevant everywhere um, and uh, does crop up everywhere, to what extent uh, the administration is uh, or uh, has or is uh, shaping its uh, diplomacy to undercut ethnic polarization on the ground. There are a number of um, ways to address that question. It's a very, very good question. I think it's interesting to take a look at the CSCE, the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, which, as you know, uh, is a all-embracing uh, organization of all the countries of Europe. Um, the CSCE has shown itself quite adept at addressing situations at the lower end of the conflict spectrum. For example, by sending in monitoring missions early, um, uh, as was done in the case of um, Estonia and Latvia over the past six to nine months. It's amazing how a relatively uh, small mission with a CSCE imprimatur, the imprimatur of the international community, going to a place where tensions may be um, starting to rise, can have a calming effect at a relatively low cost, interestingly enough. Uh, so I think that we are very interested in developing new mechanisms through the CSCE in as creative a way as we can. And, I, and we're sensing from our friends and allies in Europe a similar interest. I would say the Partnership for Peace itself has certain preventive diplomacy features when you think about it. <clears throat> the sheer fact that we are getting these uh, militaries to work together um, getting the partners in the East to uh, work toward civilian control of their militaries, to work toward transparency in their defense budgeting. All of these things have a domestic effect in their own country and can tend to um, have a moderating influence. So that's another area where I think uh, we're able to move forward in, in this way. Uh, that doesn't exhaust the, the list, but it's just an example of, of some of the things that we're looking at. Yeah, my friend Michelle, just one very quick follow-up. You're stressing the CSE as a multilateral forum. I'm just curious, does that mean that this isn't an area that bilateral relations or you know, U.S. foreign policy just within the State Department is you know, some, something that would be less of a stress of preventive diplomacy? Not necessarily. I think there will be bilateral ways in which one can uh, engage in preventive diplomacy. But interestingly enough, uh, I think you'll find that in this area, conflict resolution at the lower end of the spectrum, getting in early in a preventative way, preventive way, frequently it will be a multilateral approach which will be the most saleable and the mo most palatable in the country in question. Hi, I'm Bonnie Zay. I'm a student here. I used to work at a company that was, provide, that was providing um, services to the banking industry. We used to do a lot of business in Central and in Eastern Europe. One of the things we noticed was that there was a real problem with the banking, in the banking services industry over there because a lot of the people, a lot of the bankers really didn't have knowledge of common banking principles and banking principles as practiced in the United States. And we noticed that there was this problem starting at the top from, the, from, cent, from problems with the central bank all the way down to providing um, consumer loans, providing consumer credit, and services like checking. And um, for example, in the Czech Republic, when we were installing an ATM system there, there um, they were just starting to um, do um, provide checking services. Um, I wonder what the Clinton administration is doing to help build a strong, you know, a more consumer-oriented, a stronger banking system. Because we need, because to do business in these countries, we need, um, you know, we need a way. Um, companies need a way of manipulating, getting their money around. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. Um, 
And we are uh, attending to this as best we can through technical assistance, providing funding for technical assistance to help uh, create the kind of uh, banking infrastructure and knowledge of banking that you're referring to. I'd be happy to send you detail on that uh, if, if you would leave me your name later. But let me just say, your first point is so accurate. In dealing with the many of the leaders in this region, um, it's a, apparent that very fundamental concepts that we take almost as second nature, having to do with how markets work, uh, how money flows, how investment works, return on investment, um, liquidity of investment. These, when you've lived under a communist regime for almost five decades, it's easy to forget that some of these concepts don't come second nature to people. Uh, they're, 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 they're not inherent, uh, they're not innate. Um, and there's a lot we can contribute through this kind of training, technical assistance, and it so happens that one of the most critical sectors is the banking sector because it is, it's needed as the lubricant uh, to get the economic activity flowing. So yep. I agree with your point. We are trying to attend to it, and I'd be happy to give you some more detail on that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Michelle Ledgerwood, and I'm a student at the Kennedy School. I'm focusing on international security, and I wanted to get back to NATO. Um, I agree with you that the Partnership for Peace program was one of the major <coughs> achievements of the recent summit, and I have two questions. Um, the first, in light, aside from preventive diplomacy and in light of the fact that there are organizations out there such as the UN, the CSCE, and the WEU, what exactly is the U.S.'s perception of NATO's mission? Um, how would it currently be defined? And my second question is, with respect to the Partnership for Peace program, uh, and this may be hard to answer at the present time, but what will be the criteria for, for, for full membership for some of these members of the former Warsaw Pact? Okay. Uh, on the first question, uh, NATO, first of all, has its core mission, which is the traditional mission of being in a position to defend against an attack. But of course, the uh, monolithic threat um, of so many years uh, no longer is there. But NATO still has that uh, core mission and, and will continue to be ready. But the new mission of NATO, if I could describe it in these terms, is to be in a position to address the new sources of instability um, in the East. And those sources of instability come precisely from situations uh, which, when they get out of control, look like Bosnia. Um, by creating the Partnership for Peace, what we are essentially doing is creating a joint capability, East and West together, uh, to, uh, to uh, be able to function in peacekeeping situations, crisis management situations, disaster relief, search and rescue. Um, but this, would, uh, this will enable NATO to be in a position to uh, serve and act in situations where instability is arising in the East. Uh, how exactly that will play out, none of us really knows. Uh, what we're seeing now that NATO's doing is extremely important. Um, NATO's acting out of, in Bosnia. NATO's acting out of area. It's been doing it for some time with the enforcement of the no-fly zone and with the participation of NATO in the blockade in the Adriatic in conjunction with the WEU. Few people have noted that NATO is operating out of area, but it is. And now with this new uh, and very serious uh, initiative, um, NATO is in effect showing itself uh, able to deal with what I call new sources of instability in the East. With respect to your second question, in Thinking about the initiatives for the NATO summit, which uh, I would just like to mention uh, the whole idea of having the NATO summit was one that was proposed by President Clinton. The initiatives that were uh, treated at the summit were American initiatives. Um, and we had occasion in designing those initiatives to ask ourselves the question of, should there be criteria set forth more specific criteria set forth for expanding NATO itself. And we came to the view that consistent with our idea of a non-differentiated approach at the starting gate, which nevertheless permits the partner nations to engage in 
what I called earlier the self-differentiation process. Consistent with that, we did not want to uh, set forth specifically any timetable or criteria. And on the criteria point, we were very mindful of the fact that uh, Article 10 of the NATO Treaty itself actually sets forth all the criteria that are needed. When you look at that, it refers to bringing in nations who can help support the principles of the treaty. And if you look at the treaty, the principles are there. Um, uh, support for the rule of law, um, uh, support for political freedom. Um, and I, I don't have the text in front of me, but I commend that to you. To take a look at the NATO treaty itself, it's there. It will serve at the moment when uh, expansion is uh, an issue for immediate decision, and the criteria are, we think are fully adequate there. Thank you. Charlie? Charles Mayer. Uh, the money, uh, let me get you back a little bit to the investment issue, which you, you know about even before your State Department career. Uh, the figure of $8 billion, as you recognize, is very – foreign aid, American aid is very small compared with what we have been able to offer in the past. It probably won't go up very much. But is there no way – you put out that calculus of risks that American investors face vis-a-vis -vis India or Argentina. Is there no way that we can at least provide some incentives to American firms to lower the risks? We have – we in the paper today, of course, we've just made a spectacular sale to Saudi Arabia. The Export-Import Bank essentially guarantees the terms of that sale. Uh, is there no equivalent institution that might be thought about, created, or adopted so that instead of just guaranteeing sales, we could in some sense I won't, you know, cushion or absorb some of, the, uh, some of the uncertainty of loans? It strikes me that this would be a levered type of investment which would be much less, probably not have to be called upon in many instances, but would clearly favorably alter the, uh, the calculus about uh, sinking investments into this region. And the other question I'd like to ask you is you, you clearly delimited a region, 135 million people, 15 nations, etc., but the largest of the countries uh, outside the Soviet Union you did not mention, and it, in many ways it may be the most vital in the overall balance and that is Ukraine. Uh, I'd like to draw you out a little on what we uh, can do and are doing uh, to, to keep the demagogues at bay or the, uh, in Ukraine and to, to help that uh, fledgling country get through some very rough waters. Thank you. Thank you. On the first point, Charlie, uh, I think your question is extremely pertinent. Uh, and I would say that one institution we think uh, that can play an even more important role in this area is OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. That's uh, OPIC uh, can, in effect, help reduce the risk uh, for investment. Uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, OPIC is um, quadrupling its per project limit. And uh, I've seen the effects of uh, some of OPIC's activities in Eastern Europe. There was an OPIC uh, mission that had gone through Romania just before I was there in the fall, uh, a, a mission on which many American corporations were represented. I was very impressed by uh, the the way that went and the put, uh, and by the potential that I think uh, OPEC has. So, I think that's one area where we can uh, we can do better and and are focusing on that through OPEC. With respect to Ukraine, um, I only uh, I think didn't get into it because uh, in the State Department, uh, Ukraine is not one of the countries in my particular uh, portfolio. I'm covering 40 countries in Europe, but not the countries of the former Soviet Union. But it's absolutely uh, one of the most important issues in Europe. Um, Ukraine uh, uh, is a country of great size, great population, and it also has had nuclear weapons. Uh, and this has been a key factor. Fortunately, we seem to have had a breakthrough, a very, I think, historic breakthrough in the trilateral agreement uh, between the Ukraine, Russia, and the United States that was announced at the time the President was in Europe, in which a process 
has uh, been agreed uh, for dismantling the nuclear weapons and deactivating the nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Uh, up until now, that issue on the nuclear side has really impeded the whole process of looking at the economic issues uh, in Ukraine. Ukraine's economy is an extremely serious condition. Uh, some have said it's a form of economic freefall. Um, and we're very interested in doing what we can to, uh, to be of assistance. The fact that we've had this breakthrough on the nuclear side puts us in a be better position to do that. And I think you'll be seeing uh, in, the, in the near future uh, the exact nature and shape of what I'm talking about. We've also been in the forefront of urging uh, our allies and friends to um, do all that they can to provide assistance on this dismantlement front. On dismantlement alone, the United States uh, has uh, already provided $175 million to Ukraine and will be providing more. Uh, dismantlement of nuclear weapons is not an easy or an inexpensive thing, but we're certainly doing our part and we're urging our friends and allies to contribute to that. Uh, but you're absolutely right. This is one of the key issues in Europe today. In Central and Eastern Europe, they're all thinking very much about these very developments in Ukraine that I've uh, just described. Yes, hi. Um, I was wondering if you could comment about the recognition of Macedonia and um, what we're hearing in the news reports about the um, um, not allowing any uh, material, the closing of the route from uh, Salonika into Macedonia that's been reported today and whether you foresee any um, tensions in that region. And secondly, on McNeil Lear tonight, um, Peter Glynn of American Enterprise Institute stated that the U.S. government was going to have to, quote, unquote, force the Bosnian Muslims into a settlement and um, the way the situation is now. Um, and I was wondering whether you could comment on that also. Sure. On Macedonia, um, as you may know, um, the United States recently recognized Macedonia and offered to uh, establish diplomatic relations with Macedonia. This was in the wake of decisions taken in December by seven of the, our main European allies to establish diplomatic relations with Macedonia, having already recognized Macedonia. Uh, our thinking was that um, by proceeding with recognition, we could help contribute to regional stability. Macedonia is a, a country that uh, is one of the uh, constituent states of the former Yugoslavia. It is having severe economic difficulties of its own. Everyone in the region and the United States and others have a strong interest in maintaining stability in that region so that we do not get a spillover of the conflict in Bosnia to the south. We have deployed 325 American soldiers as part of the UNPROFOR uh, contingent in Macedonia to help stabilize the situation, help send a signal of our determination to prevent the spillover of the conflict. Um, so the goal that we have felt uh, to, to be served by our policy of recognition was to help advance regional stability, to put ourselves in a position uh, to provide uh, additional uh, economic assistance to Macedonia of a kind we could not provide if we did not recognize the country, for example. Um, now, you refer to the, the Greek decision, which was announced yesterday, uh, to restrict the flow of, of commerce through the port of Thessaloniki, which is very critical to the economy of Macedonia. And um, I guess all I would say on that is we're concerned about that development when we've made our uh, concerns known, um, and we're hoping that uh, a way can be found to resolve the differences between Greece and Macedonia. They come down to a difference uh, over the name of the country, um, and I would stress that when we recognized Macedonia, we recognized it under the name former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, because we did not want to prejudge that issue. Uh, and all of our European allies also recognized it under that name. But the name is a very, very, um, I would say, even emotional issue between the two countries. Secondly, there's an issue as to the certain constitutional provisions in the Macedonian constitution. There's an issue as to symbols on the Macedonian flag. Uh, we are hopeful that the uh, Greeks and the 
uh, authorities in Skopje can resolve these differences in the interest of regional stability. It's very, very important, and we're following the situation very closely. On your second question, uh, let me just stress that one thing that is not a part of our policy is to pressure the Bosnian Muslims. Um, we conceive, we see them as the principal aggrieved party in a very complicated situation in Bosnia. We think that what is impeding a settlement, a negotiated settlement, which is the goal of the international community <coughs> and of the United States, including the United States, is that the quality of territory that the Serbs are offering in the negotiations is inadequate. Um, the parties seem to have come to an agreement on the quantity uh, that should be allocated to each of the groups, but on the quality there's a strong disagreement, and our policy is that uh, pressure, pressure should be put on the Serbs to improve the quality of their offer, and we are not uh, pursuing a policy of pressuring the Bosnian government, the Bosnian Muslims, the principal aggrieved party, uh, to uh, do any to go in any particular direction. We are urging them to try to come to a negotiated solution. We are urging them to be as realistic and reasonable as possible, but we are not uh, pursuing a policy of pressuring them or forcing them to do anything. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'm Lisa Heinz, a student here at the Kennedy School. I'd like to return to the economy, uh, Central and Eastern Europe. You've touched on many of the elements of the economic development, and I'd like to ask you about the timing in the trip to Europe and former Soviet Union that the President recently took. One of the debates that emerged onto the front page was the question of shock therapy and whether we needed more therapy and less shock, and I'd like you to bring us up to date on your thinking and the thinking within the State Department in light of some of the transitions at the top on what lessons have been learned in Central and Eastern Europe about timing and pacing. Timing and pacing of, of the, economic development of the in economic light of the underpinnings mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. social developments yep. and yep. impacts on people. Well, uh, I think when you're talking about Central and Eastern Europe on the one hand, as compared to the former Soviet Union and particular, particularly Russia on the other, uh, there are very significant differences. Uh, and then even within Central and Eastern Europe, you have uh, very significant differences. For example, if you look at the economic performance in the Czech Republic and compare it to the economic performance uh, in some of the other countries of the region, it's very strikingly uh, different and, and better in, in, in that sense. Um, so I think one has to be quite um, discriminating in thinking how best to deploy the resources we have, governmental resources that we have, to help these countries uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, one of the thrusts of our policy has been over time to try to devote an increasing percentage of our resources to countries of the so-called southern tier, um, Bulgaria, Romania, Albania, um, because the countries of the northern tier have made such uh, good progress, relatively speaking, uh, in the economic uh, sector. Um, <coughs> but I would say that even uh, having done that, the level of governmental resources, as I said in my remarks, uh, will not be enough to fill the gap. And in terms of pacing on getting a greater flow of private investment, I think, uh, in my view, there's a, a pressing need to get that uh, flow increased soon. Uh, otherwise, uh, some of these uh, retrograde forces that I alluded to uh, could build up ahead of steam. And also, the, the sources of capital in the West, uh, which are debating uh, where to deploy, um, don't have forever. Uh, they, uh, there's capital being deployed, and I think it's essential that uh, Eastern Europe uh, compete as effectively as possible for that uh, relatively scarce resource. Thank you. This will have to be the last question. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. My name is Tim Buta. I'm an undergraduate at Harvard College. The question I have is only indirectly related to Central and Eastern Europe, even though that will certainly depend upon your answer. Um, when French President Mitterrand and um, the German Chancellor Kohl first floated their proposal in November, uh, in October 91,
for so-called Euro Corps, um, which was at first nothing more than a Franco-German army cooperation, got more specific than in 92. At first, the US position to that was very strongly negative. Um, some have seen a change in that position, particularly since the Clinton administration came in. Um, my question is, do you see a clear change of the American position on this? And if so, why? The uh, American position on this nest of issues as to how better to organize NATO to be more flexible to deal with the new kinds of security issues in the post-Cold War world. Our position has evolved. One of the major initiatives we proposed at the summit, which I did not mention in my remarks, was to pursue the creation within NATO of what are called combined joint task forces. Um, and they're, they're similar in certain ways to uh, what you've referred to, the, the Euro Corps. The theory behind this is that NATO has been organized over time to meet that monolithic threat that I referred to. And it's got a chain of command and an organizational structure which is very good at doing that. But when your new task is to also be able to address smaller sources of instability in the East, you need to make your uh, operations more flexible. You need to adapt your chain of command. And the way we conceived of doing this, it was really an idea uh, that NATO military authorities uh, came, came to and, and we were able to put some political flesh on the bones, was to uh, create the so-called combined joint task forces. And what they are is essentially within each of the major NATO commands, the existing commands, there will be embedded a smaller unit called a Combined Joint Task Force Headquarters, which is able to be pulled out in a particular contingency and to function in that contingency and to uh, gather forces under it from NATO allies and from uh, non-NATO members. Partners for Peace can contribute forces and be flexible enough to uh, deploy in that kind of a situation. Um, that was unanimously agreed by our allies. It was designed with the interests uh, of our allies in mind uh, because one of the other things going on at NATO is uh, we want to uh, see a shift, uh, or we want to see the burden sharing be a little bit uh, less on the United States and, and uh, have the uh, relevant uh, ratio change a little bit. And our European allies uh, want to do that as well. They want to build up a European security and defense identity. They're prepared to do that in a way that's complementary to NATO. Um, and we agreed at the summit that this capability would be uh, separable but not separate from NATO. That was the term of art that was used. This combined joint task force approach facilitates creating separable but not separate European capabilities within NATO and complementary to NATO. So uh, that's a somewhat technical answer, but you've raised a very good question. And my, my main point is that part of the process of adapting NATO is not just creating the partnership for peace, which is so critical, the outreach to the east, um, the practical military cooperation inherent in the partnership for peace, but also making NATO itself more flexible so it can address these new kinds of contingencies. Thank you very much. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And no arrows. No. <laughs> no luck. No luck, you know? <laughs>